Joseph, God bless you. Uh, this is the second installment in the series, What is a Christian? Part 2. And we're going to begin at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 17. So would you listen very carefully to these verses? We don't have a lot of verses today, but the ones we have are extremely powerful. So I pray that you'll just open your heart and let the Word of God penetrate you and transform your heart and your mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 17. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge in this way, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, that is, we've heard about him. Yet now, we no longer know him that way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All the old things have passed away, and behold, everything has become new. I want to reread the two key verses of this passage. That Jesus died for all. That we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again. And then verse 17, one more time, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All the old things are passed away, and behold, everything becomes new. Our second passage today is Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 10. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 10. Here's what it says in the Word of God. And this is connected to the verse we just read. You're in Christ, you're a new creature. All the old things have passed away. Behold, everything becomes brand new. Therefore, verse 5, because everything is brand new, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man and his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Put off the old, put on the new. In 1977, I began to work for my father, and I worked for him for several years. And my job was a short order cook behind the counter. And for a couple of years, I worked the night shift from 12 o'clock to 6 in the morning. And our restaurant was open for 24 hours every day. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, the clubs would close downtown, and we were one of the few places in the city of Montreal that was opened after 2 o'clock. So everybody came there. Everybody. 
from every walk of life, rich and poor, criminals and law-abiding citizens, politicians and bankers, everybody came to the Prince George restaurant from two o'clock till five in the morning. And I got to know a lot of interesting people, to say the least. On me, the counterman. And, uh, but he was a, a pretty good guy, pretty good guy, a regular guy. Then there was his friend Steve. Steve the policeman used to sit right in front of me, right here. Cliff here, stiff, Steve there. And Steve was a policeman working for CN Rail. And a lot of people would consider him a good guy, but he had a very serious drinking problem. And uh, one of the things that Steve used to lament to me about constantly was he wanted to be married, but he couldn't find a virgin. So I asked him, I said, well, where are you looking for this virginal people, uh, for this virginal girl? He says, well, I go to the nightclubs. I said, well, it's not likely that you're going to find a virgin there. But if you come to our church, we've got a whole stable full of them. And if you give your heart to the Lord, you've got some pretty interesting prospects. And he was intrigued by that. But he never came. Which is sad because the Lord might have gotten a hold of him and changed his life. Then there was Gordy. Gordy was an alcoholic, a severe alcoholic. When he came into the restaurant, he didn't walk in, he stumbled in, and he was always looking for money to buy more booze. And just to give you an idea of how bad he was hooked on booze, this guy used to stand out in the middle of Wellington Street, where our restaurant was, and stand in front of the 58 bus with a 7-Up bottle, pretending he was Zorro. So he had it pretty bad. And there was Charlie. Charlie was actually one of my favorites. Uh, Charlie was a short little Jewish man, bald head, white hair. Wore the same gray suit every day. He had two PhDs. One in political science, one in labor. And I found out that in the 1940s, Charlie was a professor in McGill University. But by now, he was in his 80s and his wife and family had left him because uh, Charlie wasn't all there. He had a lot of money, and I knew he had a lot of money because he would come to the restaurant at 9 o'clock and eat continually till 9 at night every day. Toast and coffee, three eggs turned over with bacon, a lunch special, a piece of pie, another piece of pie, a supper special, and he would go on all day long eating and smoking his cigar and blowing smoke into the air. My father used to get so upset at him because he filled the restaurant with cigar smoke. One day he went into the men's bathroom and filled the whole bathroom with smoke. I went in to get him. I couldn't find him because there was so much smoke in it. And finally, when I opened up the toilet stall, there he was standing on top of the toilet with his cigar, and he said, Welcome to hell, Lapos. He was a very, very interesting man. Two PhDs and completely broken down. Then there was Peter. Peter was a great looking guy. Man, he could be a poster boy for GQ. He was a professional skier, an alpine champion. He was a son of the president of a particular bank. I believe it was the Toronto Dominion Bank. And he was into Hinduism, serious Hinduism and meditation. And he had a guru and he was constantly sitting in, after he'd have his dinner, he'd sit in the chair and he'd you know, meditate to try to hook into these different forces. And we had long conversations about spiritual things with Peter. Then there was Andre. Andre was called the Pope. And the reason we called him the Pope is because his mother bought him different costumes. And he would dress up like the Pope. He would dress up like Romanov of Russia. He would dress up like a Cossack. And, and, and his costumes were so nice, so beautiful. They were authentic. In fact, they were so authentic that one day, Andre decided to go to the Catholic Charismatic Conference at Olympic Stadium. And they let him in. He sat up on the platform with all the bishops, and Mayor Drapo kissed his ring, which was in the Journal de Montréal the next day. He cut it out and put it up on his wall. He was proud of that, proud of that. I remember telling him about Jesus one day. I said, you know, Jesus was, he suffered, he was whipped, he was crucified, the Pharisees spit on him, and Andre was crying his eyes out. And I thought, hey, I've reached him for the, with the gospel. I finally got through to this guy. I said, Andre, why are you crying? He said, oh, they did such terrible things to me. That was Andre. 
Then there was Pat. Pat was one of our waitresses, and Pat had a reputation of going from one man to another to another. In fact, uh, she was prone to drop the man she was with now and hook up with one of our customers, which she did often. And she was struggling to get by all the time. And she depended on men to kind of finance her through her life. And that's why she would go from one to the other to the other to the other. And then there was our other waitress, Lorna, who was really an eccentric, and I won't go into what she was like, but she had attended a Pentecostal church where she was a young girl, and she rejected everything in it because they were too judgmental. They were too hard on her, and some of those legalistic Pentecostals turned her off, and she thought we were all like that. And that woman received more outreach in that restaurant than any other person I know. Because after youth group, we would all go down to the restaurant and people would talk to her about Jesus and love on her week after week after week. And we almost, we almost got Lorna back into church. She, she came that close, but couldn't bring herself to get over her hurts and bitterness towards whatever these Christians did to her and never set foot in the church. It would have been maybe a different outcome in her life if she had. Then there was a young man whose name I never learned who was a homosexual. And uh, he was a good guy. He really was. And I treated him as well as I could. And one day he came in crying and we found out that that morning his homosexual lover was shot dead in his apartment and he was never the same since. There was a number of wealthy businessmen from the community. There was Jerry from the Royal Bank just across the street who used to come in all the time. And then there was Tony. Tony was a holdover from the 50s. How many people remember the TV show Happy Days? Would you raise your hand? Do you remember the Fonz? Tony was the Fonz. This was a real Fonz. Tony Defino, an Italian. He was our Verdun Fonzarelli. And you know what's funny? He used to walk into the restaurant, eh, with the hair, with the brush and everything, with the leather jacket and the uh, 1983 Roadrunner. What a car that was, man. I never have had so much exposure to people without God in my entire life. They were all different. They were from different nationalities, different backgrounds. And some were what we would consider successes, and others average, and others were total wrecks. But there was common characteristics that they all shared. And I observed these characteristics over the years as I served them. And I want to tell you about these characteristics that they all shared. And remember, they were all different people, different backgrounds, different financial situations. But they all had a heaviness on them. They all had a heaviness. You know, you can ignore that heaviness when you're out partying, or you're buying a car, or you're achieving a worldly dream. But sooner or later, between 2 o'clock and 5 in the morning, if you happen to be sitting alone at the counter of a restaurant by yourself, the heaviness comes. And it begins to show. And I was the one that observed that heaviness in the faces of every one of them. I noticed that they were weary. Very weary with life. They, I know it was late in the day and they were probably tired from clubbing or going out or working. Some of them worked. But that's not the type of the weariness I'm talking about. They would talk about their lives in such a way that they were carrying a heavy stone on their back. And that's what I mean by weariness. And they all had it. They were all living for something that they didn't have. And they were constantly complaining. That's one thing I've noted about unbelievers. They complain a lot. And if you work in public service in a place like a restaurant or a hairdresser, or people complain about everything because there is a basic discontent in their hearts that they can never shake. They can never shake. They were always frustrated about something. They were always mad at somebody. Always mad at somebody and they talked about people they didn't like over and over and over again. And I knew who they didn't like and who they liked and who they were mad at because they would share with me like somebody would their local bartender. And they cursed. Oh man, did these people curse. Cursing was part of their vocabulary. And some of them couldn't say a complete sentence without dropping an F-bomb in the middle somewhere. So cursing was a constant. Lying, oh, lying was also a constant. They're always exaggerating about their lives. I would ask them basic questions, and they would answer the questions, and I knew they weren't telling me the truth. And I, I concluded that maybe it's because the truth was too painful 
or the truth was too boring that if they told the truth that maybe I would think less of them so they lied and they made up stories about themselves every single one of them they lived under a cloud of doom they all had heartaches and disappointments in fact their heartaches and the disappointments defined them and they all had dreams and desires that drove them but very few of them had reached those dreams and for many of them the dreams never arrived never arrived all of them were bound to the moment what was happening right now they had no big picture of life they didn't concern themselves with the meaning of life because you know what living from day to day in our culture is tough enough but who's going to think about where did I come from why am I here where am I going and have time for that it wasn't in their agenda it was not in their horizon they were living for what was happening right now and right now they're having a cup of coffee and a piece of toast in a restaurant at three in the morning they had no thought for eternity at all no regard for God and they all slept in on Sunday morning every one of them I know because I served them on Saturday night before I would go to church and they were all going to bed at five in the morning three hours later I'd be getting ready for church there was a mild belief in some of them some of them believed in God but some of them were completely hostile towards God like Charlie was he was a, a learned professor two PhDs so he had no use for God whatsoever and with every one of them there was a thick wall between them and God he was nowhere in the picture but here's the sad part of what I observed from night to night to night to night as these people came and they were regulars they were all decaying they were all breaking down they were all dying some of them are dead now Pete and Steve the brothers died before their time alcohol took them both out Charlie died of old age I think about them all the time because I love them and while they were dying there was one characteristic that stood out that is I think the I think the main characteristic of every unbeliever they were all addicted to themselves they were all addicted to themselves they were bound by their urges and passions and lusts and desires and every one of them all of them were unaware of their condition unaware every day that I served them I had such a strong empathy towards them such a sadness and a longing that one of them would find Jesus that I would say the right thing or do the right thing or set an example that would draw them into the kingdom of God and as I think of them now as I mentioned some are dead and gone I remember their faces I can still see their faces in front of me and they were all etched with pain which they denied but I saw it it was clear to me how true that verse is in Proverbs 13 15 which says good understanding wins favor but the way of a sinner is hard you know we have it backwards in the church we think the Christian life is hard but Jesus would beg to differ because he says that my yoke is easy and my burden is light so if the Christian life is hard maybe you've misunderstood something about the power of God because the Bible does not teach that the Christian life is hard the Bible teaches that the Christian life has challenges yes but that it's hard no the way of a sinner is hard the way of an unbeliever is hard and I'm a witness of it I saw it every day I suppose that's why the great Bible commentator Matthew Henry wrote about this verse that I've just read to you and I want to read it to you I want to read his commentary to you and I've paraphrased it so you understand it because the English is a little bit old Matthew Henry lived in the 13th century here's what he wrote the rule by which unbelievers govern their lives 
is a life without God. But the wise govern their lives in God, and therefore they are like a fountain yielding life and happiness. A life without God is hard upon others and hard to the unbeliever himself because they can't help but sin. They live under a curse in this life only to be plunged in an eternal curse in the next life. When they speak about life, they have no idea what they're talking about because they are drowning in their own deceitful self-wisdom. They can't help but fall into trouble. But those who are faithful to the Lord always find sound words that bring healing to themselves and others. But the unbeliever refuses to be taught, and he will certainly be brought down. They have strong desires of happiness, but they never find it because they insist on staying in their sins. It's true. I saw day after day opportunities for each one of them to accept Jesus and come into the kingdom of God. I was humbled and privileged to be able to share those opportunities and one by one and time after time they refused it. They refused it and I would go home and weep because I knew they had forfeited their answer. And if there was any indication of spiritual concern in their lives, it never included Jesus. There is always in every one of them an innate hostility towards Jesus Christ and Christianity. And they never really understood what being a Christian was all about. Like the world around us, they were more prone to look for answers in angels and gurus and forces, avatars, mystic secrets, the stars and the planets. The God in them. God, God, I am God. He, he lives in me. No, no, you're not God. He, he does, if you were God, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have this heaviness over your life. Wouldn't you have the authority to change your life? No, you're not God. Never found an answer. Never found an answer. Never found an answer. In the long run, spiritual matters were not their priority at all. They pushed spiritual realities in the back of their minds because down deep they really didn't believe in anything. And some of them just didn't want to believe. And the counter behind which I worked was like a barrier. It was like a physical representation that they were living in one world and I was living in another world. And it's true. That counter represented the truth because they were living in the kingdom of darkness and I was living in the kingdom of life and I would have done anything to pick them up by the scruff of the neck and drag them into the kingdom of God. But I was unable to do that. Only God can bring somebody to himself. I could relate to them because when I worked for my father, I had only been saved a few years. So I remember what I was like when I wasn't a Christian. Sadly, some of my family remember that too. So I could relate to the weariness and the heaviness and the anger and the lust. It wasn't that far, it wasn't that long ago that I was heavily obsessed and bound by these things. So I could remember. But at the same time, I could also feel the difference. The Holy Spirit in me. Jesus being at the center of my life. I loved them all dearly. But when they came to the restaurant every night, I was shaken. And keenly aware of the difference between my life and their life. And the only difference between me and them, the only difference was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the only difference. And he made all the difference. I never thought, never could imagine when I asked him into my life that he would resolve all of the issues that I was facing then. Hanging around with a bunch of idiots, wasting my life, dropping out of school, mentally disturbed, having been prescribed 16 antipsychotics a day by a psychiatrist seven, eight thousand miles away in Athens. Totally destitute, hopeless, thoughts of suicide. I never thought, I never imagined when I took the risk to ask Christ into my life the difference that he would make. But oh, what a difference he made. What a difference he made. 
No, it's an amazing thing. You would think that when perfection is poured into when perfection is poured into imperfection, that the imperfection would water down the perfection. But not with Jesus. When his perfection is poured into you, he overcomes the darkness of your heart. He changes everything. And before you know it, you think like him, you speak like him, you act like him, you acquire his wisdom and power, you pour out with his love and grace, and still remain totally yourself. No robes or hijabs to destroy or to kill our identity. No rules and regulations by which we all have to follow like zombies. No. When you follow Christ, you remain yourself. And that's the beauty of following him. That you could accept somebody so great, so powerful, so awesome, so radiant, so overwhelming, that he would pour himself into you and you would still retain your basic personality. Why? Because he made you to glorify him through your personality. Amazing. Amazing. And when he comes into your life, what you were before dies. What you were meant to be, meant to be emerges. And for the first time in your life, you are fully you. For the first time in your life, when Jesus comes into your life, you are fully you. Because what was missing before is now there. The presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. That's what was missing. That's what's there now. He begins to move into areas of your heart. And he forms your heart. He transforms your mind. And he conforms your will to his. That's why we sang that chorus a moment ago. He, occup he occupies every space of your life. He beautifies and sanctifies you. He molds you and shapes you. And your outlook on life is completely revolutionized. Completely changed and turned around. And the focus shifts. The focus shifts away from yourself. Upward to God. And outward to the people around you. And in that is your salvation. To be free from yourself. You become caring and compassionate. And loving and giving. Your confidence increases. Your peace, peace takes over. Fear is tossed out. Anxiety is silenced. Confusion is settled down. Heartbreak is mended. Disappointment is turned away. Wounds are healed. Anger is quenched. Scripture says he will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on him. Jesus becomes bigger and bigger in your life until eventually he himself, by himself, is your whole life. Bigger and bigger until he becomes your whole life. And I'm amazed at all the changes that have taken place in my life over the years. I was a liar. Now I'm a lover of truth. I couldn't keep my mouth shut. Now I don't need to hear myself talk as much anymore. I was fearful of new situations. Now I embrace them. I was a pessimist. Now I expect the best. Depression was a constant in my life. But now I have learned how to be joyful. Anger and resentment was replaced by forgiveness and graciousness. Because you see, before Jesus, I was just like the customers in our restaurant, enclosed in a world of self. And now I've been set free. I've been set free from myself as if I am a man loosed from a prison. And I'm grateful. And more than anything else, my mind was a cauldron of despair. The center of a never-ending storm of worry. A hurricane of restlessness. And now with Jesus in my life, at last, things were quiet. And the storm ceased. The storm has been over for a long time, brothers and sisters. A long time. Every once in a while it tries to sneak back in. But Jesus gave me a precious gift. The authority to recognize when the storm is returning and to say, 
peace be still. I have that authority. I have the authority over my anger. Be angry and sin not. I have authority over my fear because he has not given me a spirit of fear but of love and of power and of sound mind and I have authority over the lies I tell myself because his word is truth and the truth has set me free. Jesus has given me mastery over my thoughts and my feelings. And they don't control me anymore. If salvation was only that, I would be satisfied. But salvation is more than that. More than that. Only one thing controls me now. Only one. The truth of his word as communicated by his spirit in my heart. That's the only thing that controls my life now. He turned my life around. I was headed for the trash can, only to be thrown out as another victim of mental anguish, but instead, here I am. Sound, whole, powerful, redeemed, saved on my way to the kingdom of God. And the best years of my life, unlike somebody who's about to turn 62 on the 16th of January, Unlike someone else like that, my best years are ahead of me, not behind me. <laughs> so why have I told you all this? We are covering the topic, what is a Christian? I've told you all this to make the point that a Christian is someone who has been transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ and continues to be transformed from day to day. That's a Christian. Let me say it again. A Christian is someone who has been transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ and continues to be transformed from day to day. First, by the power of the cross, and then by the presence of the Spirit, because God has given me a desire to be transformed. It's funny, when I became a Christian, all of a sudden now, I was tired of being a liar. I wasn't happy being sick. I wasn't content being full of anxiety. I went to war against these things because I knew that this was not the will of God for my life. I didn't have that kind of fight before I was a Christian. But now that I was a Christian, I realized I had some pretty powerful weapons. Pretty powerful weapons. And I was ready to use them against the bugaboos and the darkness of my life. And so I went to war against anxiety and fear and pessimism and confusion. I went to war because I wasn't satisfied to remain in that state. And if you're going through something, if you are battling internally, please, can I tell you this? Here is the secret to the way out. Refuse to remain that way and go to war against yourself until you've conquered. That's the way to do it. Go to war! Because the Bible says we always have the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I can overcome my mental anguish and my emotional distress, anybody can. He's no respecter of persons. What he did for me, he will do for you. But you've got to go to war. May I say something that may shock you? I wish there were more people in here. In fact, I wish the whole, the whole body of Christ in the city of Montreal were listening to me, but through video, maybe they will. I hope that if you'll hear nothing else today, you'll hear this. Ready? There are no victims in the kingdom of God. There are no victims in the kingdom of God. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the Spirit of God plants something in you. And he says to you, and you, you begin to believe it. Nobody did this to you. You did this to yourself. It takes supernatural intervention to be able to admit that. Nobody outside of yourself did this to you, whatever this is. You did it to yourself. You are what you choose to be. And if you are born again, nothing can happen to you against your will. If you're born again, 
Nothing can happen to you against your will. Only that with which you agree and only that which you allow. As a man thinketh, so he is. Once you understand that, you take responsibility for everything that happens in your life, even if you're not responsible. What? You t yes, I'll tell you why. And here's what only the Spirit of God can teach you. Please follow me. Somebody may have hurt you. Somebody may have let you down, and you may have come under a condition or contacted a virus or gotten into a situation that was no fault of your own. But the person who hurt you is not your solution. And if you shift the blame to them, you'll be waiting till eternity for restitution. There's only one solution, and that's inside you through the Spirit of God. So if somebody did something to me, I'm responsible to get myself out, because that person will never let me out. Why? Because they don't care. And even if they did, even if they came to me on their hands and knees and begged my forgiveness, it wouldn't be enough. The resentment would still be there. So the Spirit of God compels you to take responsibility for everything that happens in your life, even if it's not your fault, so that you can take it to Jesus and let Him deal with it. See, that's what only you can do. Nobody can take your problems and take them to Jesus. Only you can take your problems and take them to Jesus. Let's take our problems to the living God and let's just, let allow Him to deal with them. And that's where liberation comes. And you can at last be free. But without a foundation in your life, you can do nothing at all. And what is that foundation? That foundation is being born again by the Spirit of God and receiving a new nature which will overpower your old nature and put it to death. Our mistake is, and it's a common mistake, every Christian makes it and they waste so much time, they try to sanctify the flesh. <laughs> they try to correct the flesh and get the flesh to think properly. It's a waste of time. Pursue Jesus. Cultivate the inner man, the Spirit of God in you. Focus on Him. Forget about your troubles. And in a short time, your problems will be gone. Because you cannot redeem the flesh. The flesh is going to die. The flesh will not be allowed into heaven. You're going to receive a new body, a sinless body. So you can't redeem the flesh. You cannot do anything about your fear. You can't do anything about your anger. It will always be there. But what you can do is cultivate love and joy and peace and then the anger will have no effect on you it will be as if it is dead and that's how you overcome something in the Lord so you need to be born again Romans 6 6 says knowing this that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin you can overcome sin in your life Colossians 3 9 says don't lie to each other since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices, you can lay aside the old self with all of its evil practices. 2 Corinthians 5.17, we read already. 1 Corinthians 5.7 says, Clean out the old leaven, so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened, for Christ our Passover has also been sacrificed. These are all verses that tell you that if you pursue Jesus, the darkness will die. You see, the Lord delights in transformation. That's one thing I've learned about him. Boy, does he love to transform people. He takes joy in reaching into the ash heap and producing gold, silver, and precious stones out of garbage. Oh, he loves it. And you know why he loves it? Because he's able to do it. I can't do it. You can't do it. But he can. And so he takes the corrupt, the wretched, the destitute, the perverse, the proud, the arrogant, the hostile and turns them into vessels of holiness and he loves he loves to do it he loves to do it because he's able to that's why he chose a liar to be the father of many nations Abraham 
He chose a coward to make him heir of that inheritance, Isaac. He chose a con man and a deceiver to be the prince of his chosen nation, Israel, Jacob. He chose a foreigner and made her the grandmother of a king, Ruth. He chose a murderer and an adulterer and promised him a son who would reign in his kingdom forever, David. He chose a prostitute and made her the great-grandmother of the Messiah, Rahab. He took a raging, angry young man and transformed him into the apostle of love, John. He took a big mouth blowhard who denied him three times and made him a shepherd of his church, Peter. And he took a ruthless, raging persecutor who hunted down, jailed, and executed his people and made him the greatest apostle who ever lived, Paul. And he wants to do the same in you. Ah, and he will if you let him. Being a Christian is all about transformation. Every true believer who has understood what Jesus wants to accomplish in their lives can say this with absolute confidence. I'm not what I was. I am what I am by the grace of God. And it's nothing compared to what I'm going to be. Come on! It's nothing compared to what I'm going to be. <laughs> I am what I am. I'm not what I was. By the grace of God, it's nothing compared to what I'm going to be. Sometimes the transformation is dramatic. Sometimes it's quiet and subtle. Depending on deep your darkness was. You know, it's been my experience that those who are rescued out of deep, deep sin are radically chained and they have dramatic conversions. It's the nice people and the good people that have problems. See, I was a good guy before I got saved, so I thought. I thought, well, getting saved is the icing on the cake, the cherry on the sundae, the sugar on the pancakes. I can go on and on. It's always food, eh? You notice that? I don't know what it is. And when I got saved, I didn't realize what a wretched sinner I was. So the first five years of my Christian life was all about Jesus showing me just what I was apart from him. And I realized, man, I'm as wretched as a killer. So good people, nice people, decent people, good students, girls and boys who listen to mom and dad, the prize of the family, the princess of the house, the prince of the house, have a hard time with transformation because they don't realize how wretched they are. But people that have been deep in sin, they get transformed and they go crazy. Don't worry, God will bring you to the place where you realize how deep your sin is and you'll be like then because you see, we all end up in the same place, don't we? Intimately connected with Jesus and on fire for God. That's where all of us are heading. Now you've received something in you that has made transformation possible because without it, there would be no hope. You've received a new nature. Your old nature, the old you, is still with you. As long as you live in this body, the old you is still there. The old, miserable, angry, wretched, confused, bickering, nasty, people-hating, whatever it is you were, so it's still with you, still with you. It's the old nature. It's the seed of sin. It's still with you. Every dark and ungodly thing lives in there. And there's a resistance to the truth of God. The old you is about denial. People in the flesh can never admit that they're off the mark. <laughs> and the more you talk to them, the more they don't like you. Blame shifting. It's everybody else's fault but yours. Pride, fear, anger, confusion, frustration, lust. Unforgiveness, resentment, hypocrisy, mistrust, unbelief, refusal to believe God's word. It's all there, still with you. <laughs> the old nature is unteachable. The old nature thinks it knows best. And all, all your internal problems comes from your old nature. It's inside you. The next time you give in to anxiety, fear, anger, confusion, unforgiveness, remember, 
Jesus came to put that to death in you. Because it suffocates the image of God. And that's what all my customers in the restaurant had in common. You know why, Jonathan, I love them so much? Because I had the same thing you had. I couldn't see them as sinners. I saw Jesus in every one of them. Because they were all created in the image of God. And they all had a place for him. But their sin quenched the image of God that they were created with. And that's why they needed salvation. So that the image of God could be released. And until Jesus comes in, it's never released. Ever. I'm almost done. The new nature liberates the image of Christ. The new nature, that is the Spirit of God in you. That has caused your human spirit to come alive in God again. The new nature seeks and embraces God. The new late nature loves the truth, even if it hurts. Even if it hurts, I'd rather be wounded by my God than to be flattered by the devil. Because his wounds heal. His rebuke brings life. Why should I despise it? The new nature is eager to be corrected and taught, no matter how unpleasant. The new nature is full of faith and love for the Lord. And the Holy Spirit works through your new nature to enlarge Jesus in your life. That's his goal, to make Jesus bigger. To constantly submit and cooperate with him on a consistent basis and be faithful. To always be present and accounted for wherever the Lord is. People ask me. They've been asking me for the last 40 years, Danny T. 40 years of ministry, I've gotten the same question. What do I do? What do I have to do? To grow in the Lord. How can I walk in the fullness of God? And my answer is always the same. And it's not going to special conferences and being prayed for by an anointed one. That'll last you a few days. That's not how transformation comes in the kingdom of God. I don't care what anybody says. I've been an evangelist long enough to know. Oh, sure, it can set you in the right direction and it can have an impact on your life at the moment, but it doesn't change you. It's what you do after that changes you. It's what you do after the touch of God that changes you. It's what you do after. So my answer is always the same. If you want to grow in the Lord and always walk in the fullness of God, be consistent and be faithful especially when you don't feel like it. That's the answer. Be consistent. And be faithful. Especially when you don't feel like it. That's what separates the sheep from the goats and the mature from the immature. The mature are faithful and consistent no matter what. No matter how they feel, no matter what's going on, no matter what may come or go, they are faithful and consistent. And I'm concerned in my heart for this generation. And we are all part of the generation, baby boomers, Generation X, millennials, we're all part of the same generation. I'm concerned. I'm concerned for the Christians of today that many will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and be showed how their lives were wasted because we took too much time off from God. Too much time off. Who we'll stand before the judgment seat before Jesus and watch the puny works of your life burn up in wood, hay, and stubble in a fire. And in tears you'll ask the Lord, what happened? Why? And he'll ask you the question he asked Adam, where were you? when I called you? Where were you when the believers assembled amongst themselves? Where were you when I looked for you in the secret place? Where were you when the time came to study my word? Where were you when I needed to stand, to have someone to stand in the gap? Well, I was taking care of my business. Yeah, well, you have your reward. You took care of your business. 
and now you'll be saved as if through a fire. I'm concerned for this generation. I am. We've allowed ourselves to be distracted by our inner conflicts, our problems. And I always get into trouble when I say this. People get mad at me, but don't. We get distracted by our domestic lives. The house, the lawn, the car, the kids, the bills, the temporal concerns. Nothing will distract you from God more than that. Nothing. Because in your heart you'll say, well, I'm a Christian and I need to take care of these things. But not at the expense of your relationship with God and your relationship with the people of God. And that's a mistake that a lot of you young parents are making right now. You put your kids in front of the things of God. Don't think I don't see it. I'm, I'm concerned for you. Don't come to me when the kids are 15 and 18 and, and tell me, Pastor Alex, my son is not interested in following the Lord. You set the precedent now when you decided to keep your kid home because that was a better place for him to be than the house of God. Come on, parents, young parents, get it together. Wake up. You're losing your kids already. And as your pastor, I won't allow that to happen. I will speak to you. I will confront you. I remember the old time Pentecostals, they would bring their kids to the pews and put them to sleep in the pews while they sought God. And that's why their kids are serving God today. You'd rather give your kids a bath and send them to bed at 8.30 while you stay home. You will reap your reward when they turn 18, trust me. Or maybe even before. I don't want to see that happen. I don't want to see it happen. Wake up, parents. And those of you that are expecting children, don't make that mistake. The devil wants your kids now. The moment they are born, he has a strategy to take your kids away from you. That's why if I had a child, an infant child, and the Lord never gave me the honor and privilege of having one, I would pray for that child and bathe him and cover him with the blood of Jesus every moment of the day, even if he didn't understand me. I would pray for him for his protection because I know the enemy would take his life if I don't watch over him. I've got to do what God has called me to do. I will set an example for my son and my daughter. The house of God and the things of God come before you, and you will follow the Lord as long as you live under my my roof it's either that or they die you can't be complacent or casual about raising your children in the Lord and by the way young parents they'll never surpass your level of spirituality wherever you are that's where your kids will fall or worse but may I challenge you pick up your game pick it up Pick it up. Raise the bar. Your children will follow. I believe in my heart every child that is born in this church will be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit before they turn four. You believe that? If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering. I believe that. But I also warn you that without your cooperation, parents, it's not going to happen. The Spirit of God lives in you. When your child is held in your embrace, there is the Spirit of God ministering to that child. So don't wait till they turn four or five and have the understanding to sit in Sunday school. It'll be too late then. Do it now. Do it now. Finally, I close with this. Some of you are running all over the place taking care of business and missing out on what Jesus wants to do in your life. That's so easy to do in this culture. You're frantically trying to get your life in order, but you don't have your life in order before God. And some of you are wavering. One day strong, another day weak. Strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak. Because you haven't learned a basic lesson. And the basic lesson is this, and it is the key to transformation. The power of the Spirit in you is greater than the power of the flesh. The power of the flesh is not more powerful than the power of the Spirit. And you have conditioned yourself, listen to me, you have conditioned yourself to give into the flesh every time the flesh <coughs> squeaks. Can't afford to do that. The flesh is a cesspool of death. Resist it. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not 
be overcome by the things of the flesh. So consistency and faithfulness is the key to ongoing and total trans transformation. We're going to finish our service. I'm going to call you all forward. Would you come join me up front? All of you, stand and join me up front. Try to come as close as you can. Joseph, go to the piano. Rex, come to the platform. I was talking to one of our worship team